Transparenz. Ich würde jetzt noch ganz kurz überleiten ähm, zum ersten Vortrag. Wir hatten gestern die Jahre 89, 90, 91 im Blick mit Aleida Asmann, Doris Grünbein und ähm, Ulrich ähm, Guttmeier. Heute gehen wir in Riesenschritten weiter. Wir schauen uns also die 80er und die 90er an und den Aufschlag gewissermaßen mit, ähm, ist der, macht, den kommenden, macht der kommende Vortrag der von den Erfolgen und Niederlagen ähm, 89 und folgende, also FF gewissermaßen handelt. Und ich kann sagen, dass wir uns überaus geehrt fühlen und uns sehr freuen, dass Karl Schlögel ähm, jetzt das Wort ergreifen wird. Er, ist, er hat an der Freien Universität hier in Berlin, in Moskau und, wie er betont, in Leningrad äh, Philosophie, Soziologie, osteuropäische Geschichte und Slavistik studiert, zahlreiche Bücher veröffentlicht. Ähm, unter anderem Moskau lesen, die Stadt als Buch, Grenzland Europa, der große Exodus, da geht es um die russische Immigration oder eben Go East, die zweite Entdeckung des Ostens. Und ähm, das alles fußt auch auf seiner Lehrzeit in der Europa-Universität Viadrina in Frankfurt-Oder, wo er bis 2013 gelehrt hat. Und das nächste Buch ist schon angekündigt, habe ich gesehen auf der Seite des Verlages. Der Titel ist Der Duft der Imperien, Chanel Nummer 5 und das Rote Moskau. Klingt sehr verheißungsvoll. In diesem Sinne nehmen wir die Fährte auf. Eine spannende Konferenz. Ganz herzlichen Dank. Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, friends, good morning to everybody. Uh, I was asked to give this talk in English to enhance and to simplify the discussion, the ongoing discussion. But I apologize. I know the limits, the linguistic limits of my ability to express in my non-native language. And I apologize in advance. First of all, I want to thank the organizers of our conference, uh, Osteuropa, the Berl Stiftung, uh, the Bundeszentrale, and especially Eurozen. Especially, which is since, first of all, I want to thank the organizers. Um, Eurozen, which is since long an organization, or more precisely, a network, keeping us in contact across borders and helping up us updating our knowledge in and out of Europe, where we are, what we are, and what we are going to do. Stuttgart, what is to be done? The eternal question. Strolling Berlin this weekend, you could get the impression of a great carnival, or what Guy Debord called half a century ago, La Société du Spectacle, or Erlebnisgesellschaft. Masses of tourists, Halloween fans, Son et Lumière activities everywhere in the town. We came together, I guess, not in order to celebrate the anniversary of 89 with Son et Lumière installations, but rather because we are concerned and worried with what is going on today, now 30 years later. We have an opportunity to remember, to reflect, to ask questions, rethinking what has happened since 1989 the year which has been called in the old, all European lingua franca, Annus Mirabilis. I'm not the person to tell the story of what 1989 was, what it was supposed to be, or what had become the outcome 30 years later. I have not the capacity, and I do not have the ambition for this. Here in this room gathered people who are able to do this. They've written regularly in the last years, New books just came out, and authors of great competence will tell us what conclusions they came to. But since I was invited, and since I have the privilege to say some words at the opening, I will talk first of all about the limits of my competence. My approach is biased and very personal, full of distrust for generalizations and the certainty which theoretical models and paradigms are supposed to give. I understand our meeting as a chance for brainstorming, or to quote one of Hannah Arendt's favorite terms, Denken ohne Geländer, thinking without a banister. 
I have to confess that I feel a great uneasiness to give an outline of the last 30 years in even most general terms. And I feel a great, yes, I have to say, despair about what people like us, writing, analyzing, being present in the public discourse, have to contribute for understanding and explaining the world which emerged under our eyes. I have a feeling of helplessness in finding a language which is able to describe the world in the making. Post-Cold War, pre-New Cold War, polycentric, post-liberal, authoritarian, post-postmodern, etc., etc. I prefer phenological approaches in, con in contrast to working with systems, models, or idealtypen. I'm well aware of the risks of my approach, and I apologize in advance for the shortcomings and disappointing disappointments which I will provoke. First, annus mirabilis. Yes, no excuse in retrospect. There was an annus mirabilis in defense of the Kairos. 30 years after, looking and listening around, one has sometimes the impression that the moment of excitement and happiness did not occur, that the event have, we have witnessed in these days has vanished under a mountain of interpretations and reflections. The historical moment, quite often deconstructed as illusion, self-deception, surreality, that in fact all what happened on the streets of Berlin, Prague, Warsaw, Bucharest, and other places was a kind of self-illusionment. The real experience of people seems to be forgotten, despite the documentaries, newsreels, interviews with people crossing for the first time the border, marching enthusiastically, strolling and exploring a world which has been shut for their entire lifetime, a moment of liberation, the excitement of traveling all over Europe, and to read for the first time newspapers they never had access to before, to visit relatives, etc., etc. The historical moment was not without illusions, but it was not an illusion. It cannot be deconstructed, made undone. It was a part of a great European liberation movement, but historical moments are not immune against mythologization. In retrospective, the historical moment had become the icon, the breaking point, the zesura between yesterday and tomorrow, the clear-cut divide between past and future. Everyone in this room has his or her own experience of the great break, which does not coincide with one precisely given date or place. For me, in my memory, the break did not coincide with the fall of the Berlin Wall, also the house I lived in 1989 in West Berlin was surrounded by the wall from three sides. And I witnessed everything in detail from my window. And I have to say, I was always in the, since the 60s in Eastern Europe, my first visit was to Prague in 65, in 66 to the Soviet Union for several months, and since then traveling and having contact to East. And the new Europe did not start in my view in 89, but it was always existing. My breaking point was not 1989, the fall of the wall, but uh, during my studies in Moscow in the 80s, the years 85, 86, and the following years, when an unknown functionary of the Communist Party declared the Soviet society needs perestroika and glasnost. I was entirely unprepared for a person emerging from the so-called Soviet system, as many others have been a surprise too. We had no words, no explications for what happened. We were suspicious, like Helmut Kohl, who called Gorbachev in the first moment a new Goebbels. We, had no, we did not understand what happened. Everything was irreal, unbelievable. I remember in these years, 86, 87, and the following, that every evening, news TV news broadcasted things unheard up to this moment. We were not prepared for 
the emerging of a hero of withdrawal, as Enzensberg has called Gorbachev. For others, may be the breaking point of the new era quite different one, depending on time and space. For some people, the Zezura was the strike movement on Solidarność in Poland in the 80s. For others, the outbreak of war in Yugoslavia. For others, maybe the enlargement of the EU. And again, for others, 9-11 or the crash in 28. Or for other people, maybe the Orange Revolution or the Maidan, the following not so peaceful revolution in Ukraine. There were many different breaks. I just want to make clear that the reduction, the concentration on one second, one historical second, one place, ignores the interrelationship of temps d'événement and long durée, the overlapping of different time layers. I do not share the view that the outside perception from the West in general was enthusiastic, triumphalist, and in a mood of, we are the victors. Rather, the opposite was the case. The surprise that Armageddon was averted, look at Stephen Kotkins and others' books. As always, in retrospective, we all know much better what has happened, but any history has its own weight, importance, independent from post-festum interpretations. Any history, to quote Leopold von Ranke, is immediate to God that is, has its own right beyond retrospective teleological interpretations. The history of the historical moment has still to be retold or written, if not yet done. Second, transformation, transition, speak teleological in a time of troubles. Transformation and transition are notions which only insufficiently grasp the characteristic features and the specificity of the processes at the end of socialism. The notions themselves imply expressis verbis and much more implicitly a hidden linearity teleology. Transformation and transition were not only more or less elaborated theories, but quite understandably a way of speaking in façon de parler. The terminology, even before Polanyi's book, comes from the Soviet industrialization debate about the transition from capitalism to socialism, people like Yevgeny Preobrazhensky or Nikolai Bukharin and others. It was a very ambitious theory, a tool, a theoretical tool of building the planned economy and to overcome chaotic, anarchic capitalist way of production. For the way back from socialism to capitalism, there was no previous experience. How to think, how to manage the process of transforming. I do not believe that concepts of a given school, be that Jeffrey Sachs from Harvard or Milton Friedman from Chicago, are responsible for the way which has chosen in Eastern Europe. It was rather the spontaneous process of disintegration of the state-planned economy, which was based on collective and state property. Yes, there have been different ways in applying theories, concepts, etc. in Poland, Balcerowicz, or in Russia, Anatoly Chubais, Igor Gaidar. But these concepts are much more based on the conditions of the national economies of the given countries, not on lessons from outside. The Soviet Union as empire, the national economies of the different countries, the difference between big and small countries, between long and short time periods of state property were much more decisive than lessons from the Chicago boys. Nevertheless, it seems to me that the inherent teleology of transition from A to B, so to say, was one of the intellectual or theoretical barriers to look for more appropriate categories or more precisely for a new matrix of analysis. It took time and it takes time to get out of the cage of categories based on ideal typen like the Weberian ideal typen of Western capitalist societies, which do not correspond to the new structures of the socialist society as analyzed by people like Rudolf Barrow. The processes under concern 
undermined or blasted away the analytical framework of the standard Western conceptions of the academic research and think tanks. Post-Soviet time was a time of wild thinking, fascinating, inspiring, and frightening at the same time. The simultaneity of quite different non-simultaneous processes, the overlapping and interplay, in my view, created a degree and an amount of confusion which traditional disciplines could not embrace and integrate. In my view, the hypothesis that, the existed, that there existed a concept or even a group which was able to reform top-down, that there was a way of mastering the ongoing processes, in my view, is quite naive. The masters, able to conceptualize or even to rule the process, to ride the tiger, did not exist. History happened. In Marx's terminology, naturwüchsig, elementary, out of control. Just to name a number of these overlapping simultaneous processes, handling the decolonization of the empire, nation building and state building, reconstruction of sovereignty, dismantling state bureaucracy and building structures of civic life, disintegration of imperial, transnational infrastructures and integration into the global economy open skies and brain drain, modernization and emigration of labor force, rethinking the past and at the same time solving the problems of the day. There were new combinations in a huge and chaotic social fabric, functionaries of the old establishment and newcomers acting in a gray zone not defined by rules of the game, corruption as a way of life and creating new modern structures the merger of kleptocracy and professional intelligence, the cooperation of power, churches, orthodox or Catholic, and the aesthetics of Hollywood. The 1990s, the years thereafter in general, can be defined as an era of wild thinking, which was as liberating as well as frightening. All terms, the semantics of all notions, the reassessment of values, the Umwertung der Werte were to be reconsidered and redefined, not in a philosophical seminar only, but in everyday life, on the kitchen table, in the public space, in the discussions about dismantling monuments, renaming streets, etc., in the state or social media. That was in many ways a game beyond rules, closer to Darwin's struggle of the fittest for survival than on rule-based competition of ideas. The subject which would have the capacity to analyze and conceptualize the people who prepared the end of totalitarianism Soviet style had not time enough, not the sufficient potential to give answers to all these problems and was outmaneuvered in most of the Eastern societies. I think we are still in a time of troubles, in years of wild thinking, and I feel that I do not have words for describing or giving any kind of summary. Third, different spaces of experience and spaces of expectations, the challenge of generations. It has become a commonplace in the last years, being confronted with backlashes, the rise of populist and right-wing movements and parties in Europe and elsewhere, to moan about the illusions the activists of 89 had. Illusions about the West, illusions about the East, illusions about liberalism, etc. But denounce illusions is all too simple. It had become a commonplace in this context to ridicule Francis Fukuyama. But the question is why and how people thought this way. And this is not just illusion, but something more serious. Thoughts and projections emerging from what is in Reinhard Koselik's terminology, Erfahrungs- und Erwartungshorizont, the space of experience and expectation of different generations and living under different conditions, belonging to different periods of time and different spaces of experience. I'm talking about the generation on both sides of the Iron Curtain. Meeting today, we have the chance to reflect about the long-enduring impact we, that imagined community of today's 
post-post-war and post-East-West divide Europeans, we lived in different worlds at the same time and in different times in the European space. Being born, grown up, educated in the Western Hemisphere, I can try to understand what happened on the other side, and I tried to do it many, many years. But it is not my experience, and vice versa. It would be quite artificial, and not without a certain force, to integrate or to homogenize these different experiences. All we can do is tell the stories, listen to the stories, tolerate or even accept the stories. Europe as a space of story, uh, storytelling, remembering, commemorating, researching. This is a real hard talk. As we know, there always has been, up to our days, a sig significant asymmetry. People of the West were not very familiar with the stories and the history of the Easterners. There has been some progress in the last 30 years, but the general deficit, the overall lack of knowledge, the lack of empathy has remained. To overcome this asymmetry, this gap of interest, knowledge, empathy will take time. Every country, every society has its own time to come to terms with its past. There is not one main road or Königsweg. And Germans, renowned as world champions in coming to terms with the past, should rather restrain themselves in teaching others. Everyone who was involved in politics of history in the last decades knows how delicate and sensitive these matters are, and it is a great challenge for us, again, I'm talking about the imagined community of a generation, to tell the stories which will, in some future time, bring up a European collection or ensemble of histories still far from the history of Europe. Looking back at what and how Europe's intelligentsia has come to terms with the conditions of their times is quite instructive. We had the generation of 1945, summarizing the age of totalitarianism, the experience of war and revolution, mass destruction, genocide, exile. Hannah Arendt, Franz Neumann, but also Viktor Kravchenko and the authors of The God That Failed. We have the generation of post-war reconstruction, with people coming back from exile, finding a new language for a devastated continent, Horkheimer, Adorno, but also the young pioneers like Enzensberger and Habermas preparing 1968 in the West, or Czesław Miłosz, Jerzy Gidroitz, or Leszek Kolakowski and others in the East, at home or in exile. We have the dissident generation, the pioneers who undermined the Soviet Empire and the East-West divide, Solzhenitsyn, Sakharov, Istvan Bibo, Havel, Kundera, Michnik, the pioneers of telling the truth, telling the historical epos, and connecting dissidents on both sides of the Iron Curtain. They were the pioneers of 89. They defined the language, the tonus for the new time, and the question for me is, what has the generation of post-89 to offer in comparison to the earlier generations I have mentioned? The generation I belong to was a blessed generation without the menaces, endangerings, and risks of their parents' lives. Most of us, again, the imagined and maybe illusionary community of generation, most of us lived in well-ordered circumstances far away from war, violence, atrocities, the comfortable life with a certain lack of experience of the hardships of life. Yes, we lived in a kind of comfort zone, in a world of welfare and security, where traveling abroad were taken for granted, as well as the functioning of an effective state bureaucracy and the institutions of liberal democracy. <laughs> the dubious or dark side of this life in the comfort zone is a lack of experience, erfahrungsmangel, and the basis for the illusion that this world is the scale and way of life for everything and everybody in other places of the world. This is one of the reasons for insensitivity and the limits of perceiving and engaging. 
It is not sufficient to say that we had some illusions since after 89, misunderstanding of liberalism, not understanding the relevance of the national question as claimed by some in self-critical reflection now, post festum, but it is necessary to analyze the intellectual environment for generating these misunderstandings. We are all children of Schengen Europa and children of the bubble we live in. Europe beyond dreamland thinking without banister. The situation that history did not follow expectations, visions, dreams is not new. We had it after many times. For instance, after the collapse of the empires and the devastating World War I, when people were expecting eternal peace. Ernst Stolz, one of the most sensitive observers of post-World War I Germany, described the spiritual situation in the early 20s as Traumland, where everything would be possible, peace, recovery, Europe hailing its wound. Traumland is the term for openness, for a future, for projections, great designs, visions. Generations which went through disasters believe sometimes to have become immune forever against aggressiveness, xenophobia, hate, intolerance, violence, and other sins and crimes of the past. And then suddenly they are forced to learn again that there are no lessons for how to solve the conflicts they are confronted with in the present. Every generation is forced to learn again and again and to build up the well-known virtues, decency, courage, solidarity, and there is no guarantee that we are able to stand strong, to stand up, to resist the temptations of two simple solutions. The future will show how this, our generation, will stand up in times of troubles, chaos, waves of violence, discrimination, persecution. The arrival in the present world is sometimes harder to perceive and to react to than to deal with the cruelties of the past. Ideologies, words, slogans matter, but much more decisive is real behavior, attitude, courage or cowardice, indifference, maybe permissive tolerance to use Marcuse's term in a different sense, or the heroism of, and, and I'm quoting this, the heroism of US citizens, for instance, who decided to roll on to bring down the plane of United Airlines Flight 93 on 9-11 and who sacrificed their lives in order to save the life of others. To fight the fights in the present time is sometimes much harder than to resume and reenact the fights of the past. We, the spätgeborenen, the later borns, know about the ends of history without taking the risks of being involved. We have the overview, at least we like to imagine this. Resistance in the present time is something quite different. The present time is in Ernst Bloch's words, das Dunkel des gelebten Augenblicks, the dark of the moment we have lived through. Now we live amidst this mess of troubled times. The problems which are on the table are well known the end of a bipolar world and the emergence of a multipolar world, the rise of China as a global player, the comeback of Russia on the international stage after a period of retention, the end of the American century and the destabilization or even erosion of the European Union, the radical transformation of the economy under the auspices of social media, artificial intelligence, etc. Under these conditions, everything is in flux which is reflected in a total confusion in a time of anything goes. There is a left fighting imperialism, aggression, war crimes, but silent on Russia's aggression in Ukraine or on the war crimes in Assad's Syria. There is a warmonger who is performing now as a peace broker, delivering a masterpiece in international diplomacy. I'm talking about Putin. And now there's going on a discussion to give Putin the Nobel Prize for his peacekeeping mission in Syria. <laughs> there is an American president betraying his allies who were the most active and effective in bringing down the Islamic State. 
there's a European Union unable to find a joint response to cope with the rush of mass migration. There's a crisis of the welfare state, an emerging gap between rich and poor without a perspective of how to cope with the rising gap between rich and poor. The rise of authoritarian strongmen all over Europe tells us that they got support, not only from, from deplorables, but by rather broad social strata, including members of the middle class. A part of the answer why this is the case, the rise of this silent minority, is obviously that the strong men are quite smart and without scruples, knowing how to make it. But the other part of the answer is that others, the opposition, the non-authoritarians, the non-nationalistic, the civic and liberal forces, did not listen to the questions and did not give the right answers. The non-authoritarians did not have an answer how to get back control over the mass migration movement, how to moderate the huge secular wave. They liked to call the insistence on national sovereignty nationalism. They did not have an answer how communities on the long run can provide care for hundreds of thousands still to come. They did not have an answer how to integrate, or let's say, how modern citizenship in the 21st century should look like. In the 1990s, Ralf Dahrendorf wrote about the emergence of parallel worlds, of the parallel societies of the ordinary citizens and the globalized class of cosmocrats. We know this phenotype of its representatives since we of ourselves belong to these kind of people. Housing today in Berlin, tomorrow in Helsinki or London, commuting between conferences in LA, Dubai, Paris, with kids in international and multilingual kindergartens. I always was shocked being on the campuses on the East and West Coast, meeting people who were everywhere on the globe, but never in Gary, Indiana or Akron, Ohio, the lands of the Rust Belt. The victory of Trump has to do with this kind of absentism, neglect, and ignorance. The same goes for a large group of intellectuals in Europe or in Germany, who discovered the East only after the landslide victory of AfD, or maybe even for parts of the Warsaw Intelligentsia, who are more familiar with the timetables of Brussels air airports than with the trains in Polska B. The summary of this chapter is quite clear. To say farewell to Traumland and say hello, welcome on the ground. Is there a German Sonderweg again? Return to the Mitte, the Russian factor. There is or was a long discussion, especially among German historians, whether there was a German Sonderweg. That is an interesting subject, but I do not believe that there is something like a special road since all history is based on Sonderwege. There are, of course, some peculiarities which came again to the surface in the process of reunification. Obviously, these are reunification of a divided nation and country, the asymmetry formation with different cultural legacies, different ways of overcoming the Nazi past, etc. Dandina wrote about the comeback of the German question based on a number, volume, and power of an eight million nation in the center of Europe. After Russia has re-entered the stage of international diplomacy, some comment on the comeback of the Russian question. I do not believe in the cyclist eternal repetition, but I am concerned about the role Germany is likely to play in a European Union, which is in danger to erode and to disintegrate under the stresses and strains of the new global situation. Germany seems to be very strong a pillar of stability, but even now, without a looming economic recession, Germany is, in my view, much more vulnerable than it seems at first glance. A majority of Germans want to reconcile with Russia after the deterioration of German-Russian relations in the aftermath of Putin's aggression against Ukraine. The big companies want to go back to business as usual and demand the lifting of the sanctions. The mainstream wants to have good relations in the tradition of Bismarck, as it is often, often said. 
Germans feel responsible and guilty for the millions of victims of the German aggression against Russia, although Germans fought their war of annihilation against all peoples and nations of the Soviet Union. Germans have strong sentiments for Gorbachev's Russia due to his contribution for peaceful unification, but ignore the impact of the democratic movements in East Central Europe. Many Germans like the stereotypes of the so-called Russian soul. The pro-Russian alliances are emerging across party lines, from the extreme right, AfD, to the left, with prominent proponents among the most prominent Gerhard Schröder, former chancellor and Putin's man in Germany, first lobbyist in finalizing Nord Stream 2 pipeline between Russia and Germany, bypassing North and East Central Europe. Not to forget the relatively strong minority of Russian-speaking people who feel two loyalties toward their first and their second homeland, quite comparable to Turkish Germans who vote rather for Erdogan than for Merkel. All this in the context of a general mood of anti-Americanism, especially in Trump's times and his disastrous policy. There's a kind of Ukrainian fatigue and many are inclined to put pressure on the Ukrainian government to make compromises, which in fact would be a triumph of appeasement, paving the road for further destabilization of Europe. Conclusion, we should have an eye on the vulnerability of Europe, of Germany especially, in the times of troubles still to come. I'm coming to an end. The paradoxes of Europeanization. Wizz Air, EasyJet, Ryanair, have changed the mental maps of Europeans and I think even more than many, many conferences of intellectuals. The brands of these low budget carriers stand just symbolically for what I want to say. The radical changes in the last 30 years, the explosion of mobility across the borders, millions of people learning by doing, exploring, creating new networks of knowledge, experience, connecting neighbors, accelerating time. Time is money now. The places to be have changed. Lemberg, Lviv, 30 years ago, the metropolis of Europe's provinces, the title of an essay I wrote in the mid-1980s, is now a hub in Central Europe. Now desti new destinations everywhere. Riga, the city of Art Nouveau, Warsaw with a skyscraper downtown skyline, Moscow's five international airports, Kiev, Kharkov, sites of European Soccer Championship in 2012, St. Petersburg's European University and the CEU in Budapest as center of all European excellence, the rebirth of cities after decades of dilapidation and decay, etc., etc. Of course, we are aware of the other side, the so-called collateral damage of radical change, brain drain of the best educated and qualified, mass migration of workforce to the West, leaving behind emptied landscapes and the orphans of globalization, rust built ruins all over next to super malls, the new outflow of knowledge and expertise, CU Budapest now in Vienna, the young pioneers of Russian social media now in Vilnius or Dubai, the awful loss of manpower and civic engagement. Yes, and not to forget war. Wars, the destruction of Yugoslavia, thousands of victims, hundreds of thousands of refugees and displaced persons, the ongoing war in Ukraine with two millions of displaced persons, more than 13,000 deaths, the devastation of an industrial region, and new nationalistic myth and hate speeches after a period of discovery and painful search for identity. Maybe this is the state of normalcy of Europe after half a century of stability in divide. Part of this normalization is the West too. The West as a homogeneous entity ceased to exist. The former West entered a period of search for a new equilibrium. There are fusions we could not expect 30 years ago. The Western financial system, the great banks as money laundering machines for trillions of capital channeled out of Russia and other countries. London as hub of kleptocracy, 
Miami as the best place for investing dirty money in the real estate market, Skanska and Deutsche Bank as money laundering institutions over many, many years. Eastern corruption moved westwards and fused with homemade corruption in harbors like New York, the city of the yellow devil, as Maxim Gorky called New York 100 years ago. As we know, investigations inside the new authoritarian regimes and on the traces of these transnational networks of corruption are not without great risks, just to remember a few people who risked and lost their lives in struggling for truth. Anna Politkovskaya, Natalia Istimirova in Russia, Jan Kuciak in Slovakia, Daphne Caruana Galicia in Malta, heroes of the transition period too. Now at the end, learning from sketches, everything, every time, anew. I have no message for all this. People like us should leave the physical and intellectual comfort zone we are accustomed to live in. We should rethink the limits of our bubble and go into the open, exploring what happens on the ground. Listen not only to each other. We should be aware of the great intellectual challenges in dealing with an entirely new situation and try in all modesty to do what others before us have managed to do, using and sometimes reversing Karl Marx's words in German, es kommt nicht so sehr darauf an, die Welt zu verändern, sondern sie angemessen zu interpretieren. Denn diese Welt ändert sich in rasendem Tempo und die Analytiker kommen kaum hinterher. In English, philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point, however, is to change it. No. The point now is to interpret a world which is changing all too fast. There was a great time of exploring, describing, analyzing in the pre-1989 years. For instance, the Polish school of reportage. One of the key words were Alexander Solzhenitsyn's and Václav Havel's message, tell the truth. This message is not out of date. To insist on the truth is not an old-fashioned slogan, but fresh and full of risks. Investigation, exploration, redrawing the mental maps of Europeans along and beyond the old new fault lines is a very hard job. In order to do it, it is necessary to develop a bit more of present time consciousness, a bit more of self-awareness, of Geistesgegenwart, a bit more history, not as a lesson you can draw or as a sermon you can preach but as a way to be informed, to be ready for the challenges to cope with now and ahead. I thank you for your patience. Thank you very much for a thoughtful and, as I would say, also thought-provoking uh, speech and lecture. We're going to have a 20-minute coffee break until 11.20, it's a bit shorter than 20 minutes, uh, to process what we just heard and to discuss. And afterwards, we'll have uh, mainly a panel discussion where uh, we can discuss what we just heard together with Rika Kingapap and also Karl Schlögel. See you later.